Hello and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with New Role, the business-oriented podcast that brings the boardroom to your channel of choice. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of New Role, the board-level hiring platform that specializes in the high-value chair, independent director, advisory board member, and trustee placements that drive high-impact boards. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Julius Weinberg. Julius is an experienced chair and board member in the education sector in particular. Julius has spent the most recent decade on the boards of Ofqual, Ofsted, Kingston University, City University, Latimer Upper School, Beaconsfield High School, Ormiston Academies Trust, as well as the Public Interest News Foundation, Buckinghamshire Culture and the Secular Society, to name just a few. As a former vice chancellor, Julius has a wealth of knowledge and experience of leadership and has led major change management programmes, which have often addressed issues such as academic promotion and progression. Julius has also been instrumental in addressing the attainment gap of individuals from diverse backgrounds, whilst also establishing major building programs and delivering financial stability. Julius is a physician with a specialism in public health and clinical infectious disease and describes himself as a broadly educated and curious, holding degrees in physiology, medicine, education and humanities with art history. Julius, a huge welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. That always sounds like an obituary, doesn't it? <laughs> Introduction. <laughs> Julius, I'd love to start with, now I, I was talking to one of the, the people who knows you researching this call and asking them what sort of questions should I be asking. And, and one of the questions they often get asked is how on earth do you go about finding people for a board in the education sector? You're sort of what's your recruitment process? And you've been involved with so many different types of institutions in the education sector. What have you learned about building boards in the sector? What's been your secret to success? I think that's a really good question. And the answer is, I don't have a secret success because I don't think I've always been successful. It is really difficult to build boards, especially if you want a bit of diversity. And I don't just mean diversity in the sense of gender, ethnic origin, background. I mean, diversity in all its senses, if you want boards with a variety of people from different backgrounds. We make huge demands of people who are on boards the time they have to spend. We expect them all to have huge amounts of experience. That ends up meaning you have boards which are full of people like me, you know, white male stale is the old jargon phrase have now. One of the things I think we have to challenge ourselves about is that that notion of fairness, that we have to apply the same standards to everyone on the board. If you apply the same standards, you will get just the same sorts of people. So I think we have to start thinking about having different standards for different sorts of people on board. So if you want somebody younger, so actually when I was at Kingston, I proposed that we had at least two board members who had never been on a board before because I wanted younger people, different sets of ideas. And I also thought that as we were a, an educational institution, we ought to be thinking about developing future board members. So I think boards don't think broadly enough about their role of developing people. We just think of boards as senior people who are going to do the strategy stuff. I think we need to think much more dynamically about them. I had lots of discussions with the civil service board about how do you get different sorts of people onto boards like Ofsted and Ofqual. And I think we have to start being much more imaginative about how we set up the criteria. But I might say that actually we don't expect all board members to sit on 15 different subcommittees. You know, if you're younger, if you're an up and coming senior executive, but you're mid career, you probably don't have the time to do that. So we shouldn't expect it of you. We should enable a different sort of people to get onto boards because they can make a fantastic contribution. So it's a long answer to a really good question, which is, I don't know, but I do know that we have to start thinking really hard about how to recruit differently to boards to extend our net out into different environments and get newer and different sorts of people onto boards. Because once they get onto boards, they'll get the experience and they'll be great. That's a great challenge. As you interestingly, I was, I was talking to someone in the context of looking at diversity in public appointments recently. Mm. And one of their pushbacks was boards are not juries. We're not trying to be representative of the broader population. There are certain qualities that you're looking for in board members in a way that, you know, in a jury, it's much more unopinionated. How do you think about the composition of your boards? Are there 
building blocks. So I sometimes hear people talking about, you know, their CEO whisperer as an archetype that they're looking for that, you know, I know my own experience as a, as a CEO, I've sometimes missed or found it very helpful having that person on the board who has had that CEO experience. And I guess one of the reasons why lots of boards do have probably too many CEOs on it, but it is helpful to have someone who understands what it's like to be in your position, whether it's as a vice chancellor or a headmaster or whatever the role may be. But how do you think about those building blocks besides just having the people without the experience? Are there other mental models that you apply? Yes. So I think there are skills which are useful to have because they help you ask the right questions of the CEO and the executive team and to think about the external world. So it's useful to have a lawyer. It's useful to have someone who understands numbers. It's useful to have someone who understands HR. And I think those people with those skills help you cover, you've got to cover the risks. Then after that, you also need people who are going to help you ask the question that you haven't thought about, which is why, again, although we're not looking for representation on the board, I think we are looking for diversity because you want diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. And you want someone who's going to come in and say, well, actually, you've completely missed this. You know, I'm, I'm 10 years younger than the rest of you, and you're trying to sell a product or you're trying to deliver something, and you're getting this wrong. Haven't you heard of TikTok? Or you know, whatever, you know. So I think that you've got to cover the risks. You've got to cover those basics. But then after that, the purpose of the board is to ask the supportive and challenging question. And I would say the reason you're there is to make the chief executive or the executive team as good as they can possibly be. You're not there to run the organisation. And that's, again, there's a slight risk of having too many people who run organisations on boards because they'll tend to default to that sort of way of working. And it's a different way of working. So, yeah, cover the basics. Make sure you've got people who can say, are we really getting the legal side of this? Or I can help ask the right questions. We've got to go and get some lawyers in. At schools, universities, there are often legal challenges. To have someone on the board who can say, I don't think you're briefing the lawyers right correctly. You're not asking the right question. It's really helpful. But after that, it's about having really bright, thoughtful people who are willing to push the boundary and say, I think you about this, or is your strategy really right? Why are we doing this? And are brave enough to do that. And then you want to get the mix right if you can. And again, it's about having a mix. You know, I'm not a great finisher completer. Actually, I'm quite good at signing off. I'm very good at ideas. I, I get a bit bored of the middle bit. So I need to surround myself with people who are good at that. And frankly, the, the best people I've had on boards with me, or actually my work, are people who irritate me endlessly. <laughs> they do stuff that I can't do and I don't do, and I find it irritating, that bit, and they'll sort of say, slow down a bit here, or you, you've forgotten this. And I think it's about trying to get that mix right. If there isn't, I always think if there isn't a bit of grit in there, there's a problem. Yeah, no, I like that. Do you, do you ever think about the... I suppose personality types, we did recently did one of those things internally where we were, I don't know if you've come across the sort of reds, blues, yellows and greens, you know, blues being your logicians, reds being your sort of emotives, greens being your organizers and yellows being your creatives. That's a very crude summary of it. But it's fascinating for me seeing sort of our team divided into these groups. And I've, I've done exercises like that in the past. And you suddenly realize why certain people clash and you suddenly realize you couldn't do without each of those and they combine and it, it was making me think gosh i've never really thought about the boards that i sit on in that light and how sort of the different dynamics of the way people think and and also i have sometimes thought about it in terms of you know the kilman five modes of conflict like people who are prone in intense situations to competing or collaborating or accommodating or compromising but is that something you also give thought to when you're thinking about that composition Probably not explicitly enough. I think implicitly I do and think, yeah, I want to be. So, well, I, certainly on one occasion appointing a very senior person to my, my executive team, we had two candidates where when you scored them out, they were exactly the same. They had different strengths, different weaknesses. And I went around the board and say, OK, which one would you be most comfortable working with? And they all said, I knew what was going to happen. They all said the same person. I then said, right, we're taking the other one. It was a slightly complacent team and I wanted a bit of grit in there. So sometimes I think about that explicitly. And one of the things I did in one of my chief exec jobs was to take my executive team and do a sort of physical Myers-Briggs. So we were having okay. an away day and we actually had a room and we got people to stand and there was a cluster of, and there was one person who was completely different. 
and I was slightly different, but he said, now I sort of, you know, whether you like the science behind Myers-Briggs or not, you believe it. And I think the same is true of the, you know, the thing you were talking about roughly comes out of the Edward de Bono seven thinking hat. They're ways of getting people to think about, okay, why are there differences? And Mm. what I like doing with the the Edward de Bono seven thinking hats, for example, is taking the person who naturally might be a bit conservative and say, right, you're Mr. Yellow Hat today. So it gives you real permission to just yes. fire off or take the person who's naturally always a bit wild and say, right, you're Mr. Black Hat today. You, you know. So and that, I think that's fun to do. And you, you treat it as, as a game, but making people think that actually yeah, there are completely legitimate other ways of working. So I don't tend to use it explicitly, but I do sometimes think about that. Or just think, actually, I, this board isn't working or it's too cosy. What do I need to do to get me? Again, the problem is that our methods of selection are really not very good. How do we decide that someone's got this character tray when you're meeting them for an hour? You get something from CVs or backgrounds. Now, I guess in the education sphere in particular, it strikes me that can sometimes be very difficult. You're managing a wide group of stakeholders, often with very different interests, especially when it comes to sort of briefing what you're looking for. How have you managed to, or what have you learned about navigating that so you don't end up with a sort of a camel as a horse designed by committee? problem when thinking about the candidates that you're going after? I think it's, again, an interesting problem. So, for example, in schools, you will have a mix of parent governors, you'll have local authority governors, you've got an academy trust, you'll have some independent governors. And I think the real problem there is actually often for for parent governors and parent governors who, especially in a small school, will be under huge pressure to be representatives of the parents or might feel that it's an opportunity for them to you know, either push a personal agenda or do something that's the benefit of their child's cohort. And again, it's about educating people. They're no longer, they're there to look after the interests of the school. And that can be quite tough. And I think it's, it's tough for the board. It's tough for the individual as well. And especially in a lot of schools, a lot of small schools, you're fishing in a often a not very sophisticated pool for governors. And you just think about it. Every school needs a governor. Every hospital needs a governor. Every charity needs a governor. We are asking for enormous numbers of people to look after these organisations. And I sometimes think, again, one of the benefits of bringing organisations together or maybe having boards of governors that look after several different schools you know, what's one of the advantages of academization, I guess, is that at least you're not spreading your talent pool so thinly. Universities often have very strange boards with representation, with people who are representatives. And it is their job on the board to fight the corner of they are the student union representative or they are the staff representative. Or they are. Now, there is some benefit to that, but also that creates tensions. And I think, again, it's for the chair to manage that and to manage the t- And then you have some organisations with boards of 40 or 50 people because they haven't yet managed to trim them down. And those are fundamentally dysfunctional. They can't work as boards, not as decision making boards. They have a, a different function. So I think that within the educational space, because of the history, there are a variety of different sorts of boards. And on the whole, most organisations have been trying to shrink them down and make them more strategic because the turnover, that is asking a lot for chairs of educational boards. Interesting. You also talked earlier about the benefits and dangers of having a customer on your board. And I think back to my experience of having in the sort of commercial and commercial boards of having customers on the board. It's always been a nightmare. And on the schools group that I sit on the board of, you know, I've always advocated against it. I think having a sort of parent on the board creates a conflict of interest. And I think there are other ways to get that perspective into the boardroom through different subgroups or whatever. But what's your perspective? You talked about benefits and, and disadvantages. How do, how do you think about that in your ideal education board? And I don't know whether it would be different in the university space versus sort of schools versus a mat. What do you think is optimum? Well, yeah. So in the school space, you will almost always have some parent governors. And they can be great. But as I said, I think it's difficult for them. It can be difficult for the organisation. And one of the problems, again, in the school space, if you don't have parent governors, it can be very difficult to find enough governors. Mm. Because why would you become a governor of a school unless you have a personal interest in there? Or you can go for ex-parents or you can look in, look around 
other people who have some sort of vested interest or affiliation, emotional affiliation with the organization, like former parents, former students. So I think that by and large, I think it would be better if you didn't have parent governors and you sought the views of parents through other means. But I think practically it would be quite difficult. And so I think therefore what you could do is manage the conflicts for the parent governor so you can get the best out of them. Or maybe we should have some sort of national swap scheme so that parents of one school could become yeah. governors at another school. I know, you know I've thought about this and we, 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 yeah. we, we've actually done a little bit of that one school I've been in where we wanted some experienced educational input. So we sort of arranged with another school that we would get one of their senior teachers because there would have been a conflict and that we would do some sort of swap there. And we actually done a couple of board to boards. So I think, again, we need to think a little bit more laterally about how we can get the skills in. And as a school, as a board, you want some reasonably high level educational input to yeah. be able to push the head about what they're doing educationally. Where are you going to get that from unless you get a teacher from the school? Now, they're clearly going to be conflicted. So they're not going to want to quiz their own head teacher. So can we arrange some sort of pools locally, swap systems, great experience for a teacher to be on the board of another school, support that school. So I think we're not thinking laterally enough about how we can get the skills in and achieve the outcomes that we want. Parents as well. Actually, a parent, John has got some experience of child going through a school recently, is actually quite an interesting thing to have. For many boards, actually having a customer insight would be quite interesting. But can you get a parent from another school or from somewhere else? So I think there are ways that we can try and it's about saying, okay, what are the skills we need and how can we get those in a way that doesn't create tensions or create conflicts both for the institution or for the individual? Yeah, that resonates a lot. Actually, up front of the, the group, the school group I sit on, I don't have a child there, but I have got kids in other schools not far away. Yeah. And actually that dynamic has worked really well where I'm not conflicted for the school, yeah. but I pick up a lot from the local area, the communities around their schools. And also I'm sort of, you know, I'm the customer in effect. So that that resonates a lot. And I really liked your idea there. I mean, we see there's a huge demand from a lot of corporates to get their next generation of executive talent exposure to the board roles. So that's something we've been thinking around, like actually there's a win for them to get exposed to boards. And if we could connect them yeah. to those schools that are local, it could be a win-win where you get the benefit of well, that talent. Yeah, I think that I mean that's something I, I try to do, and we had some discussions. So again, going to large corporates and saying, "Do you have some rising stars? Wouldn't it be good for them to get some board experience? How about we'll partner with you if you have some? We won't guarantee them because they might not be right. We will guarantee to interview them, and then for that individual, again, if they feel that actually that's part of their career development. They won't, don't you feel guilty about spending some time off going to a board? We'd say, well, we won't expect that person because they're a younger executive. We won't expect them to be on all the committees and we will give them some mentorship. I think there's a real possibility for developing, as you say, some win-wins. And that way you'll get some really talented younger people onto some boards with some benefits for their career and real benefits to the organisations that they're, they're on the board of. Okay, brilliant. Now I want to come on to assessment because you touched on that earlier and some of the challenges of assessment. What is your approach to it? How do you assess candidates? And particularly your point earlier around getting a more diverse group of people and not just looking for the sort of the same old types. Do you have a, a framework that you use, a playbook? Again, it's largely about really trying to tease out why someone wants to be on a board. And so I think I said earlier on, the function of the board is to make the executive team as good as it can be. If I was to, you know, do the strategy stuff. But in a great organisation, the executive team will be able to bring forward the strategy and propose it to the board. Board members aren't there often enough to do it all on their own. So that's for me is, how, can I test this person against that statement? Do they understand that that's what they're there to do as a board member? And it's interesting how often that hasn't been the case. People have come forward and their motivations for being on a board have been often because effectively they want to run something. They see it as a way of gaining pseudo-executive authority rather than actually saying, my real role here is facilitative. And I think that's because many people coming forward to boards have had successful executive careers. And they have been, and it's really testing when I question them, is how they will feel when they don't 
have the levers of control and how anxious will that make them feel? And what would they so how do? do you, how do you test for that? It's fascinating. If, I, if I'm sitting here as a sort of prospective candidate for your board, how are you asking me that? How are you testing me? Okay. So a question I might ask them, especially, so say, particularly if you've come from a commercial background and you're coming to a school or something, so I'll say, how important are sales figures for you as a board member in managing your business and making sure the chief exec is working out? How important do you feel that sort of thing is? So you can answer that question. So I'll say, well, okay, so how would you feel about an organization where you didn't get any sales figures? Because the sales happen, for example, once a year. Or if you're looking at your product chain, it's three years before you see the outcome. How would you feel about that? Now, it's very interesting if you go down that, and I think that's why some people who've come very successful business careers find being on public sector boards really difficult because they're not getting that regular feedback. And some people say, well, actually, that's a really interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. And then then they think about it and you get really fascinating conversations about what else might I use to make those judgments or I just have to behave very differently because I'm not going to know. Sometimes people then say, "Mm, I don't think I could cope with that. But it's about asking those sorts of questions. I think those are the areas where I think there are differences between public sector and private sector boards. It's about the tracking feedback you're getting as a board member. And I've seen people basically find it very uncomfortable or sort of say, well, how do we know that the organisation isn't going down the pan? I love that. Now, what would your response be if you were asked that? Because I know you have brought quite a sort of commercial mindset to the organisations that you've been involved in in the education sector. So what would your response be if you were sitting there and being asked that question? Well, I think mine is is that actually we have to work with longer time frames and we have to accept that it might be quite a long time before our interventions show an outcome. So, for example, if you want to go up in the National Student Survey, it might take you four or five years. Now, an intervention now is not going to affect years two and three Probably they've already got their minds fixed about what you're like. So it's not going to be until year one goes through. That's three years' time. So we have to be realistic about what the timeframes are. We have to look to see if there are any proxy measures for whether we as an institution are doing well. So what are students saying on the Twitter sphere about us? Actually, it's it's softer information. But if you want hard information, it's just accepting that the timeframes are longer and therefore judging the success or not of your intervention is much harder. Super it's, interesting. It's, I was, I was having a... having to, it's having, in a way, to trust the executive team. And maybe that means that you have to test them quite hard before they put an intervention. Because once you've done it, you can't do... I love the idea of rapid prototyping and the way that designers work. Lots of time talking to designers, you know, do something, watch what happens, change it. You can't do that if you're making a major intervention. If you say you're going to fundamentally change your course structure from 30 credit modules to 15 credit modules, why? What's the evidence? Once you've done it, you can't after six months say, oh, I don't think that's working. We're going to change it back again. Mm-hmm. You can't change your packaging. Um, yeah, so I think is- it requires some really possibly a little bit more interrogation before you do something as a board member, because you've got to accept that once you've made that decision, it's much harder to reverse. If you make a decision about changing your packaging or or marketing something slightly different, it really doesn't work out. So, okay, right, we'll cut that chain. We'll shift it to something else. And I think that's, that's a very difficult thing, both for especially people moving the commercial sector into education, feel exposed because they think, well, how do I know that we're doing the right thing? Well, you're not going to know until next year. Well, not actually, I was having an innocent discussion with someone not so long ago where I'm thinking about, this was in uh, secondary schools, how do you measure your impact and saying, well, the reality is, you know, if you subscribe to the Solon School of Thought, you know, never judge a person happy until the end of their lives. And actually, yeah. <laughs> you've got like an 80, 90 year lead time before oh. you see anything. But that, in effect, you know, if you judge as most education institutions do based on exam results, you end up in in a sort of a complex situation, which isn't necessarily driving the long-term outcomes that you're looking to drive. So it's, uh, I love the way that you've sort of highlighted you know, that. 
difficult. So, you know, for example, I've been talking at one school saying, why are you still using this very old measure of how many kids go to Oxford or Cambridge? Mm. It's sending out completely the wrong message to all those really bright kids who maybe wanted to go to Warwick or Edinburgh or Bournemouth to do media studies, which is probably, or Kingston School of Art to do fashion, Mm. which is harder to get into than Oxford or Cambridge. Mm. Surely the measure is how many of your young people get to do what they choose to do, yeah. what they want to do, not Oxford or Cambridge, it's probably what their parents want to do. So it's about trying to change the metrics and think a little bit more about the right metrics to guide the organisation as well. So you found your person, they're keen to do the role, and you're yeah. sort of starting the onboarding process. So something we, we, we started offering these sort of peer-to-peer support groups where we're getting sort of board members together in sort of a networking forum where they can sort of open up with some of their challenges and something that's jumped out at me listening to them is it's amazing how many of them feel very vulnerable in those roles when they first go in and often quite unsupported what's your approach to making sure that your new board members as you bring them on feel supported and and sort of get up to speed quickly and particularly in, in schools and universities how much time do you spend getting them into the classrooms into the the lecture rooms around the the campus what's your approach to that I think that's quite difficult because it's getting the balance right between giving the person the opportunities to understand and learn what they need to without making them feel pressurised that they've got to spend endless time visiting schools and these are busy people with other things to do. And again, they're not there to be experts in education. Maybe one or two of them are. They're there to actually challenge and ask difficult questions and interesting questions and help support. So I think it's firstly... It should be fun to be on a board. People are giving up their time. So it's it's about trying to construct environments. So, for example, with the Ofsted board, when I went to, which was not a particularly happy board at the time I took over, the organisations had some trouble. They used to have dinners before the board, which inevitably turned into a discussion of the board meeting. You know, and they because people don't sit there saying everything is fine. People used to find things to nitpick about. So I said, right, either we're stopping these dinners, or I don't want to do that, or we're having these dinners, but we're going to use them constructively. So we'll have the dinners and I will bring in, we will find someone interesting to come to the dinner as a guest and talk to us about the broader world of education. So we had leading academic educationalists. We had people from Other environments were interested in education, like senior prison officers. We had chief executive of councils talking about all that. So we would have a dinner with a really fascinating discussion. We'd get to know each other as people because there'd be a bit of chat as well. And we wouldn't talk about the board agenda. So that was building both the knowledge of the board. The trust is really important. So people have to trust each other if they're going to say things that might be challenging. If five people, eight people sitting around the board all think one per thing, and you're thinking, I really, I really don't like this paper. There's something you have to trust people. And it, that might be the most important thing that's said all meeting is that one person that's seen something that the rest of us have missed. So it was about building trust between board members, making sure they all felt that they have value and using opportunities to enable people. So, well, actually, if you want to go into schools more, we can arrange that for you. But you don't have to to contribute. And if people aren't contributing, it's always very easy if people are contributing. If people aren't contributing, you then have to say, well, why not? What can we do? And if you really can't give the time or effectively work out how you can contribute to the sport, maybe it's right for you to stand down. I've had to do that as well. So how do you think about as a sort of chair? Think about the agenda for the year. Do you sit down at the start of the year and map it out with your CEO and fellow board members? Or are there sort of building blocks that you're looking to get in, in every one of your boards or are there, is it very different? Yeah. I was thinking about this earlier on today as I started to think about planning out agendas for a new board i just just taken. I think there's a real difficulty with traditional agendas. So we bring a bunch of very bright people together. We stick them in a room. We start off by boring them to death with a whole lot of tedious governance. And then after about an hour and a half, we then present them with something to think about, a think piece, by which time their brains have turned off. Now, what I've certainly done in the past is try and completely split the agendas, ideally not just, and now we are going to do a bit of brainstorming, but either have that out on a different day and have, okay, we're going to have some board meetings which are just governance and going to be very short. 
ideally, unless there's a problem. And then the strategic stuff. Or, you know, you have a, a break, a bit of lunch or something like that, and then another session. But I, it's something I'm puzzling about still is how we get the best out of people, because I don't think you can ask people just to switch their brains from detailed governance think and looking at a spreadsheet to, and now we're going to think about three-year strategy, or now we're going to look at the challenges because there's another school just being opened down the road. And it's about constructing, you know, I was always known for whenever I go into a room, I just move the furniture around. How do you construct environments for the right sorts of conversations? Go and sit next to someone different. You always sit in the same place and sit next to the same person. You have the same conversation. So I think actually we need to think again about agendas and how do we get the best out of these people and how can we struck the agenda? Should we actually put the minutes and the matters arising last so that when people are fresh, talk about the blue sky stuff first? These are things I think I don't know the right answer to that, but I do know that we need to think about it. And certainly, again, with one other board, we completely split the agenda. So we'd have a short governance agenda, then stop for lunch, then had blue sky. And that actually made quite a big difference. Super interesting. Well, I guess sort of it ties into a lot of the pedagogy and sort of science or neuroscience of the way our brains work and function. That makes makes a lot of sense to me. You've been operating in a period where we've had something like six education secretaries in the last four years. How do you as a sort of chair stay on top of that shifting landscape? I don't think anyone is on top of the shifting <laughs> landscape. And what we, you know, we've had just in the last few months, we've had a promised education bill. We were all told that all schools would have to be in academies by 2030. Then that's vanished. I think it's very sad, you know, that we've had, you know, will we see an education secretary that stays there for more than a few months? It says something about where education is placed in the hierarchy of agendas. I'm sure I do the same as other people. I try and read the rooms. I have my networks. I try and talk to people. I have a meeting with a group of other chairs of trusts at the uh, Department for Education next week. But, you know, I shouldn't think the Department for Education civil servants know what the agenda is going to be in a year's time. It really has been pretty distressing. So, again, I think it's falling back and saying, what is right? What should we be doing in education? irrespective of what the shorter term agendas are, what should we be doing for our young people? What does good education look like? When I went to Ofsted with Amanda as the chief regulator, I was saying, well, actually, a good school shouldn't really worry about an Ofsted inspection. It isn't a performance. It's about good inspectors can recognise a good school, whether they perform, you know, on the, they don't have to perform on the day. So it's about saying, OK, what does really good education look like? And I think we need to think hard at that rather than what's the next bit of government policy going to look like. Is that really right? Uh, sort of whenever I talk to educationalists, it strikes me that there's a lot of gaming of that system going on. And as a board member, it's always slightly terrifying when you're sort of listening to people trying to figure out how to game the system and that, that often they'll feel like it depends on who you happen to be inspected by and what mood they happen to be on that day and that can have a have a big impact is that's not your perspective um I, I think the trouble with gaming the system is you can get the game wrong mm. i think you have to be honest and it's like going back to one of your earlier questions about interviews i always tell people advise people when they're going to an interview is just be yourself. Don't try and game it. Because one, you don't know what's going on in the other side's mind. It's a dangerous thing to game it because if you game it successfully, i.e. you've sold someone you're not, <laughs> then you're in trouble. So what do you do as a board member to instill that culture when you've got an institution that's facing some sort of review? What are you looking for? What are the actions you're taking as a board member to ensure that the exec are approaching it in the right way? I think there's the simple one which all educationists should be get good at, which is read the exam question, right? So, okay, present what you've got to present, but don't overread the exam question. A lot of what schools do in response to Ofsted, for example, it's not what Ofsted's asking, it's the mythology surrounding it. And often it's convenient for boards or principals say, we've got to do this because Ofsted wants us to, and actually Ofsted don't want us to. You know, so... I think, again, it's about going back to what your strategy is and what your values are and explaining those effectively. And you've got to be confident in those. 
and think, well, I think we are doing the right thing here. And if you then come out of it badly, well, you've then got a question. Maybe we weren't doing the right thing. Or you say, well, actually, they got that wrong. Now, by and large, actually, you know, certainly with the new framework for Ofsted, it was it's very much about understanding what the school says that it's trying to do and that it can do it coherently. You know, it's certainly encouraging that way of thinking. And so, you know, so for example, when I was vice chancellor at Kingston, all the universities knew that there was a BME attainment gap. And you know, Hesse kept asking for more research. Now, my view is we didn't need more research. We had to start doing some pragmatic experiments, say, can we actually close the BME attainment gap? So I challenged our HR department and got someone really, really brilliant who was willing to take it on. So as a university project, if you can show me that we can do stuff, no point in saying we do something if there aren't any inventions. If you can show me that we can do stuff which will close this, I will persuade the board to make it a university KPI. Go away for six months, work at a project, come back and we'll talk about it. And she did. And we made it a university KPI. We put in the resources and we closed the attainment gap. Now, that was just the right thing to do. It was because, you know, and it, my always felt, well, if we close the attainment gap in the long run, that will also improve our NSS scores and everything else. But it's just the right thing to do. So I think values are really important and being sure about what you want to do and how you want to be seen as an organisation. So, of course, occasionally you've got to play a game, but it's dangerous because you might misread the rules. So sure. be sure that it's the right game that you want to be in. No, that makes complete sense. As you sort of think across all the boards that you've been involved with, both as an exec and a non-exec, are there particular moments that stand out where you feel those boards have added most value? Are there sort of specific examples that stand out in your mind where you think, wow, thank goodness for the board there? So again, when I was a vice chancellor at Kingston, the university had to some extent been blighted by planning blight. It had always wanted to take on the old, sorry, county, county building. Here's a good question for trivial pursuit is which county, county council building is not actually in the county? The answer is sorry, it's in Kingston, and that's no one quite. And, you know, because of that, and it almost bought it a couple of times. So when I went to Kingston, I, I, I looked at this and I thought, well, actually, you know, we had a pile of cash because we were going to buy this building and a whole lot of buildings in a state of disrepair. And I basically said, look, if I can't sort it out with the council within four to six months that we will get that, then we've got to do something else. And then talking with the board and ultimately coming to the conclusion that we would walk away from that and build a statement building. And that board was incredibly supportive, understanding it from an educational point of view and a state making a statement about the ambition of the university. And we had very good the chair, Roddy Line, was brilliant at that. And we had some really strong buildings people on the board who understood that. And I think that really helped me because I'm not a buildings person, but you know, I sort of wanted to do this. Now, I'm going to boast now because that building that we built won not only the Sterling Prize, but also won the Mies van der Rohe Prize, the only building in the UK to won the two biggest prizes in architecture. And it's a great building, but it was about a board then which challenged quite a lot, really pushed, because it was a lot of money, really pushed hard about why it was going to make a difference and why we need to do it and why it wasn't just a vanity project. And having people who I respected a great deal, who really understood the risks and were willing to, uh, one, ask the right questions, but two, once they'd made that decision, absolutely back it up. Got it. So I, I and, think and that that's one example that really sticks out in my mind, yeah, where I was uncertain whether I was doing the right thing. Brilliant. And on, on the, the sort of the other end of the spectrum, the board contribution that everyone should look to avoid, are, are there any sort of moments where either as an exec or a non-exec you thought, gosh, that was not the board uh, sort of adding value? Well, I've, you know, I have been in a board in another in another time when the chief exec and the board basically fell out because they basically weren't talking to each other effectively and neither were in the wrong. It was one of those awful situations where you see good people talking past each other in a way and becoming more embeddedly suspicious of each other. So, you know, and I, I've seen it just as, well, a slightly different example. Many, many years ago, I did a study of hospital boards for DFID 
and one West African hospital where the board was meeting every two weeks because it didn't trust the chief exec. And the chief exec, who was actually very, very good, was spending his entire time servicing the board and couldn't run the hospital. But, I, you know, that was, I learned quite a lot there about how things could go seriously wrong. But I've also seen that happen in a, a UK institution where, you know, good people, but unable to break out of what had become a, a rather malignant lack of trust. And if you were to sort of go back now, knowing what you know now, do, do you feel like that was a solvable problem? Is there anything that you think could have been done differently? Or do you think sometimes you just run into these situations where it's just unfortunate? I think in that situation, it was just unfortunate. It was about personality types and it wasn't going to be soluble without one or the other side stepping down to such a degree. You always talk about losing face. That's essentially what happened in the end. Um, so if I if I was sitting there facing that situation now as a board member, what would your sort of advice to me be to navigate that situation to expedite the sort of the optimum outcome? Again, I think it's about having that honest conversation. And that's why I always I like the idea of having a SID. So if you, you as chair are effectively the relationship between the chair and the chief exec is really vital. So if you as a board member just think that that relationship is going pear-shaped, it might be, and sometimes there is fault on one side or another. So you have to say to the chair, look, I don't think you're managing this properly. So if you're a board member and you don't feel you can do that, that's why it's good to have a SID that you can go to because that is flagged as their responsibility and they then have the permission or the right to go to the chair and say, look, we need to have a conversation about this. Or if you think it's the chair that the chief exec, then you go to the chair and say, look, you know, we really think that the chief exec is hiding stuff from us or whatever else is going on. So I think one of the responsibility of all of all board members is if they really feel uncomfortable in that sense, is they have to flag it up. And it might be that the chair says, yeah, fine, I understand why you think that there's stuff going on that I can't tell you about at the moment or whatever the reason. There might be reasons there might not be. But I think that that's why it's important to build those relationships of trust in the hope that you never need them. Mm. You you, you need the trust enough so that everyone on the board feels they can say what they want to say. But if you look at all board failures or all organisation, almost all organisational failures, at some point it's been people knew what was going on but didn't talk about it, Mm. felt didn't have the confidence to talk. I used to teach about use the Kegworth air crash. Remember the Kegworth air crash was when a plane came down on the M1 and the pilots basically switched the wrong engine off and the air stewardesses knew which engine was on fire but didn't feel they had the authority to talk to the pilots. It was about trust and it was about hierarchies. And it was a, it changed the way that air pilots talked. And it's great teaching for starting to teach doctors and nurses about number of times where you know, nurses have stood there knowing the surgeon's about to chop the wrong leg off. doesn't happen anymore because people are taught about it. But it's about making sure you can build that level of trust for that one occasion when you, you have to speak up. And you know, board members you know, need to know that that's part of their responsibility. And therefore, part of your job as chair is to ensure that you construct the sort of environment where that is necessary. People do feel they can speak up. Yeah, such a, that's a great point. Well, when I've, found, I've sort of experienced where there was a particular topic where we had a board and we had a board expert or a subject matter expert on it. Mm. And I remember I just switched off a little bit because I trusted in that expert. And I always wondered when people said, oh, how could you switch off? And then having experienced that, oh. seeing an expert who sort of steps and you think, well, they've got this. I don't know anything about this. I'll switch off. And actually, that was just the moment when I should have been asking the stupid questions that didn't make sense to me. So that that really resonates. I think, you know, none of us want to look like idiots. And I think that's why I worked for someone years ago who was one of the country's leading experts in a subject. And he would always sit there asking really stupid questions. And it wasn't because he was stupid. He was endlessly sending out a message to all the junior people around that there are, it was just a great thing to do. There are no stupid questions. You know, he'd sort of, you know, ask, oh, is that an, you know, he knew perfectly. But, you know, and that was, you know, I learned from that and I hope I mimic that a little bit. But you know, I think in a way that's one of your job as a chair sometime is to ask the stupid question. 
what a lovely way to finish Julius. time has flown by and i've, I've massively overrun but uh, it means it's time to move on to the sort of five question quick fire as a, as a wrap up if that's all right where well, i'm going to say a short statement and ask you for a quick response if you're ready go on fantastic so first up best book every board member should read and why Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow by Daniel Kahneman, because it makes you realise just how bad our thinking is and how easily it could be manipulated. Fantastic. Love that one. Your favourite quote and why? If you can keep your head whilst all those about you are losing theirs, you have not fully understood the seriousness of the situation. <laughs> one, I love Kipling. Two, I love the distortion. <laughs> and it's, it makes a point. Love it. Your best ever holiday in way? Oh, my wife would be very cross with this, but I love skiing and I, my kids all ski. And it's just those occasions that I've been out, out in the middle of nowhere. We've all skied since we were little, I know. Middle of nowhere, deep snow. Kids took me, paid for a guide to take me and all of them off into deep snow, summer, a whole day, broad sunshine. Love doing stuff like that with my kids, that's why. My wife, unfortunately, doesn't ski, so she'll be very cross <laughs> with that. She, she was there in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. Your most significant professional insight? Most significant professional insight is that it's all right to be wrong. I think one of the great things about clinical medical training when I did it, was, you know, you saw a sick patient, you think what's happening, you give them some treatment, you go back two or three hours later and look and see if things are planning out the way you thought they should. And if they aren't, you change your mind. Nothing wrong with changing your mind. And last but not least, your favourite podcast? Actually, I don't listen to podcasts, but I do listen to lots of audio books. So you said app otherwise. So I guess or, it's either, or app if you don't listen it's to the either podcast, yeah. Audible, which is I get lots of audio books, or Libby, which is the online way into the local libraries. So I get books from Libby. And I read them on my tablet or I'm listening to an audio book. Oh, amazing. Judith, thank you so much. It's been such a privilege listening to you and, and benefiting from your extensive experience and wisdom. So thank you so much for taking the time to share it with us. Hey, thank you. It's been interesting a lot of fun thank you Oliver.